Good morning. It is great to be with you today. And uh, back home, we are glad for the time that we were able to have a little vacation away, but it's always thrilling when we can come home to our church family and be with you. Um, speaking of family, there are several in our family that I need to mention today so that you would be praying for their families. And uh, so I did want to ask you as a congregation and brothers and sisters to be praying for the men's family, for the Esch family, for the Anderson family. Jackie and John, I believe, are very near to going home to be with the Lord. And so we certainly want to keep Paul and Gloria and the families in our prayers. Um, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. For me to live is Christ and to die is. We remind ourselves of this when we come together as God's people because this is hard. And so we rally around them in prayer and in the promises of God. Um, Lauren is struggling with mobility and other things, and so I know Barb and Lauren would appreciate your prayers as well. Um, we also have a praise, right? Um, baby Theodore was born to Jared and Chelsea Demerly, so we praise the Lord for that. Uh, Theo the Mighty is uh, still in the NICU, so uh, we want to be praying for him. No, he's Yay, he came home last night. So uh, updated version, and uh, so we can praise the Lord for that. That's exciting, and uh, just you can continue to be in prayer for him as he develops and catches up. Came a little early. So uh, with these things in mind, and with the word of God open before us, would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we love you. You are a good father. We thank you that we can boldly go before your throne. Not just for our own needs, but also carrying with us the concerns of others. And so, Lord, today we do think of the, the men's family and the Esh family, and certainly, Lord, we are anticipating Jackie and John's homegoing. We praise you for that promise that they will be entering the land of the living very possibly. Father, we pray that you would be with Lauren. Lord, renew his strength day by day. And Father, we ask that you would um, encourage Barb as she cares for him and the family and others. And Lord, we just ask that you'd give strength. Father, we praise you for good blessings. We praise you, Lord, for Theodore and, Lord, just so many young ones that have been born here in the last couple months. We celebrate um, with these families, and we praise you for that. And we just um, continue to ask that Theodore would mature and, uh, and uh, Lord, just become strong and sufficient uh, through the care of his mom and the doctors and all involved. Uh, Father, we love you. We love your word because it is truth. And so as we open it today, um, Lord, would you teach it? Uh, even through a, 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 a vessel, Lord, that is not worthy. Father, we love you, and we ask that you would be glorified in all that we do and say in Jesus' name. Amen. The power of perception is an amazingly powerful thing. I've sat with individuals who have had body dysmorphia. It's, it's a perception where they feel and look and see that they are something that isn't true. They, they see themselves as very heavy. They see themselves as not exactly what they want. And yet, to everyone else, they would look perfectly fit, perfectly fine. Um, I, I think... All of us kind of get this a little bit, have a, a thing in our life, a perception in our life that helps to define us, and it probably shouldn't. It's a, it's a wrong perception that we might have. Um, I, I think sometimes myself, um, I have a perception that I am, in some ways, always Brian, the dyslexic that got held back in sixth grade, right? It doesn't matter how many degrees I get. 
that stays. Why? I don't know. It's a perception I have. Perhaps you have a perception of maybe, you know, in, in middle school, you got teased about something. And it's not true at all of who you are today, but it something you brought with you. Could have been a body image thing. It could have been an unathletic thing. It could have been a, whatever it might have been. And, and, and for some reason, in some way, there was a perception built and you've kind of carried it with you. You know, it's interesting. Um, an elephant can be trained in an amazing way with the power of perception. When an elephant is a baby and someone wants to train an elephant to be tethered, they tether that little baby elephant and that little elephant pulls and pulls and pulls and pulls and realizes very soon that it can't beat the tether, right? That it's chained to this or it's tied to this and this wins. Well, as that elephant grows and becomes a five ton behemoth. Do you realize that its owner only has to put a tether around its foot? It doesn't even have to stake it down in the ground. And that elephant thinks it's stuck. It could run or roam at any time. It has unbelievable power. And yet it submits to a tether that isn't even tethering, right? Paul, in this passage, is warning the church, and he's saying, listen, church, who you are, your true identity is not who you are acting like. You have a perception problem. You don't know who you are in Christ. And because you don't know who you are in Christ, you're doing things that you do not need to do, submitting to things that you do not need to submit to, believing things that you ought not to believe. And so he's challenging them in these false perceptions to change the way that they think. And he's saying in Colossians 2.8, make sure that no one takes you captive. Don't be like that tethered elephant. Be free in your redemption, in your freedom that Christ gives. Live in the victory that Christ has won for you. You know, Paul is always very careful in all of his letters to make sure that he starts with the indicatives, right? Who we are who you are in Christ, who Christ is, what the gospel is, these statements of fact. And Paul did that through this letter. So the first several chapters, that's what we soaked in. We, we, we soaked in the preeminence of Christ. We soaked in what it means that we are joined with Christ and that we are in Christ, in God, right? And, and so we've, we've been unpacking these truths. And now he's getting to the part of the book where it's imperatives, what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to act. In other words, if this is who I am, if this is who Christ is, if this is who I am with Christ in God, then this is how you should live. This is how you should respond. This is the, the freedom or the power or the, the, the um, transitions that you are free to make in your life. We, because we have a victorious Savior that rose from the dead, have victory if he is our Savior, our Lord. And so the first four verses that we looked at two weeks ago, they reminded us of who we are in Christ. And it was if-then statements, right? If you have believed in him through faith, if you've accepted Christ as the Lord of your life and the forgiver of your sins, then we die with him. Our sins are put to death. Our past life is put to death, right? And we have been raised with him to new life. We are new creatures, you might say, well, where did the me go? <laughs> Verse 4 tells us that, that we, as new creatures, are hidden with Christ in God. We have now this Christ-centered life that we are free to live. We are eternally secure through Christ in Christ. We are protected from spiritual enemies and, and even, unbelievably, the wrath of God because our sin has been paid for through the finished work of Jesus Christ. 
We've been been given complete access to the blessing and the celebration of God just as if we won the victories that Christ won. It's unbelievable. Verse 4 says, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We have a future hope, an everlasting hope that we will receive the inheritance of God in the home of God forever. So Colossians 3.2 reminds us that being in Christ changes the way that we think, right? It says, set your mind on things above. A child of God stops looking perhaps at the things of the earth saying, this will satisfy. Stops looking at the things of earth and saying, this is where I am going to settle in and put roots in. But instead, we have hope in heaven. We, we look at the things above, and when we're talking about the things above, we said we're not talking about the streets of gold, although they'll be amazing. We're not talking about the mansions that are being prepared for us, although I'm, I'm sure that it will be mind-blowing. What we're talking about is Christ. And so constantly through the passage of Scripture, he talks about Christ and being in Christ and who Christ is and the preeminence of Christ. We will be like Christ, with Christ, having a resurrected body like Christ. Christ, watching the glory of Christ shine forever, not even needing a sun. Why? Because we have Christ, right? It's unbelievable hope that we have. Uh, it, it not only should change the way that we think, that we are satisfied by Christ, but it also is going to change the way we live. And that's the passage that we're going to read today, how it doesn't only just change the way that I think, but when you think right, you live right, and it starts to change the way that I live and the choices I make and the decisions that I have. Listen, we don't live in the realm of Adam any longer. We live and dwell in the kingdom of God. And so what that means is that the kingdom of heaven comes down, in a sense, in the way that we live. Kind of kingdom down living. So, what will I do in heaven? That's what I'm going to do here. What wouldn't I do in heaven? That's what I'm not going to do here. It's kind of practical. And so, what God is calling us to is kingdom down living. Now that I'm a child of God, and that's my home, and that's my Savior, and I'm living in Christ, then what I want to do is I want to live like I'm saved freed, changed, to live. And here he is going to kind of in the rest of this chapter give us a vice list. And you see that in verses 5 through 11. And and these are things that we're to put off. Like like take off these ratty clothes. Um, There are times when I was a kiddo that I would go to walk in the house And my mom would go, no, stay right there. Take it all off in the garage, right? You're not coming in. You're a mess. Well, there are things, okay, I become a child of God. We recognize, I I need to take this off. It's not God-honoring. It's not going to bring flourishing. It's not helpful. And then there's things that we're going to put on. And, and, and we're going to study what is the, the Galatians version of the fruits of the Spirit that we see in Ephesians. And he kind of recycles them. And what you'll see is what that is, is putting on Christ, right? Because it's Christ. All of it is Christ. And so we're going to have a vice list that we're going to take on, and we're going to have a virtue list that we're going to put on. When we get to this, the do's and don'ts of ministry, I have a a few fears. One of the fears is this. Um, Say you're new with us and you came today. You might say, oh, here we go again. Every time I go to a place that that uh, opens the Bible, they're going to talk about what we can't do and what we should do and the sins and all of this. And, and, and I want to explain something to you. As a child of God, what I once loved has changed. What I once 
wanted to do and be has been reversed. You see, the hedonistic thinking that was just to serve me selfishly is no longer who I am. Now I have, to quote John Piper, Christian hedonism. And you say, what in the world is that? It's this. My delight comes through God. And whatever God says, I believe that it will bring joy, flourishing, peace, transition and change for the good in my life. And you know what? It's been proven to be true. Christ has revolutionized my life. So when I see this, I don't see do's and don'ts that are laborious. As a matter of fact, the law of God is not laborious to us that are Christians at all. We want to lean into this. Now, it doesn't mean we don't have trouble with it. It doesn't mean that these aren't challenges in our lives, but, but we lean into them and say, we want to know, we want to change, we want to be who we're saved to be. We don't want the old hedonistic life. We want this new delight in Christ life, this Christian hedonistic life that God has given us. Does that make sense? So I, I, I want you to hear that, 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 oh, here we go. They're going to talk about don't have sex and don't curse and all of these things, the to-do list. Yeah. We are going to run through this list, but we think this is the best thing possible to put off. Why? Because God said, and God is an amazing dad, and he said, put it off. So we wish to do that. Uh, second, it's, it's important that we don't um, take this talk in, in some type of moralism way that, okay, I, I don't know Christ, but I need to start doing good things. I do good deeds, and I can earn God's favor. You know, he talks about this in chapter 2, verses 20 and 23, and and he talks about legalism here, and he calls it elemental spirits. He says it's a, a simplistic, immature lie to believe that you can merit base, that you can earn your way to heaven, that you can do some good works, and you can be good enough that you enter eternal life. And so what we want to realize is that Romans 3, 11, and 12 says this, without Christ, no one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. You know, a while ago, um, we were in our home Uh, celebrating uh, just having family back and Cheryl and I were talking and and we were saying, um, hey, I wonder, I wonder when our daughters get married and have a kid, I I wonder what they're going to call us as grandparents, you know? And and that's kind of a fun name and they're they're all all over the place, right? I, I don't, we had uh, you know, there's me, ma, there's papa, there's grandma, there's grandpa, there's, I, I heard of a doodad, right? Uh, and, and that's because he loved Mountain Dew, right? So, I mean, they're, they're, they're all over the place, and it can be all different kinds of things. Um, but my favorite memory is my mom and my pop up. Um, can I tell you that my mom was an amazing, good woman. My favorite by far. But my mama believed her whole life that she could earn her way to heaven and that she didn't need a savior. If that never changed, she never made it. It, it, it. Mother Teresa, without accepting Christ as her Lord and Savior, the forgiver of her sins, and the only morality that God is going to accept, will not make it. With God. Because without Christ, it is impossible to please God. Without sinlessness and righteousness, it is impossible to appease an infinitely holy, good God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. 
And so Romans 14.23 tells us that everything that does not come from faith is sin. It's, it's filthy rags. It's vain glory. I'm not saying that people can't on a vertical level do good things and good works. Absolutely. I've seen it. She did it. She was amazingly good. Better than most. But that good never went to worship And if it never goes to worship, then in God's economy, it's not good. Make sense? So, what we want to do is, first of all, realize that all of sin comes short of the glory of God. And that we're desperate for the grace of God. And when we accept that, and acknowledge that, then there's good news. Forgiven people are changed people. They're transformed people. They're able to put off sin and to put on Christ. And they're raised in the victory of Christ. And what we're going to look at is that they can also mortify the flesh. They can kill sin because sin, in essence, is dead. So let's read verses 5 through 10 together. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry, on account of the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self, which is and its practices, and have put on the new life, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. What are we talking about here? We're talking about mortifying the flesh. You say, that's a weird word. What does it mean, killing? You know, it was John Owen that said this, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. It's a true statement. Either we're fighting sin or sin is fighting us, taking over us. Romans 6, 11 is, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. If you're a believer, this is your posture. This is your attitude. I'm, I'm dead to sin, I'm alive to Christ, I'm going to mortify sin. And, and what is sin? I think this is a good definition of sin. Sin is anything we desire, think, or do that stand opposed to the glory, the word, or the beauty of God. Anything that we do or think or say that is against God's heart, God's law, God's word, sin. I think verse 5 is very vicious language. Put to death. Not manage it, right? Not, Not contain it. Put it to death. It's like lice. You don't manage lice. You don't try to contain lice. I've never had it. But I would run fast if I saw someone that did. Right? It is a fast spreader. And what you don't want to do is just say, well, go to school. I put a hat on your head. But I know parents that have done that. You know what they did? Spread lice through the whole school. Right? You can't contain it. What do you have to do? You got to change the bed seats. You got to cut the hair. You got to use a special shampoo. Right? You got to kill the lice. Put it to death. What, what is God saying here? He's saying, listen, you don't manage sin. You kill it. You put it to death. You mortify it. You hate it. You abhor it. You cling to what is good. You abhor evil. It's no longer your friend, right? How many of you today are just trying to manage your sin and control it? How many of you just want to wound your sin? Try to make it your master, Maybe you just want to have a leash for it. Walk it around and you think you can control it and it'll stay on that leash. 
kind of like I think I can do that with my dog. I'll cage it. Listen, whatever it is that is in the process of killing your relationship with God, kill it. Right? Fight it. Do not accept it. Do not just try to manage it. If we keep it at all alive, inevitably, it will come back to harm you. Inevitably, it will come back to drag you away from the flourishing and the good that God has for you and into pain and lies. Jesus even said that we should have radical surgery, right? If you have a temptation that's continual, and he, he used really powerful language, shocking language, right? If your eye offends you, if your eye lets you tempt all the time, then pluck out your eye. And if your hand is doing the same thing, then cut off your hand. And what is he saying? He's saying, listen, this is serious. Temptation is always going to be there, Christian, but don't allow it to turn into sin. Seek those things which are above Listen, people with an above perspective, right? Heavenly perspective, Christ perspective, treat sin harshly. They don't coddle it. They hate it. They abhor it. They fight it. If my position is dead to sin, if that's what Christ has won for me, then my practice should begin to mirror that. I should be Moving beyond sin, fighting through sin, putting aside sin, killing, mortifying sin that was once prevalent in my life. Are you a a, a Christian cooperating with the, the power that is available to you through the Holy Spirit, through the power of God in you? Or have you allowed yourself to become weak? as sin becomes aggressive. The Greek would say that we're to reckon it as dead. Reckon it as dead. That's what killing sin is. It's it's looking at it and kind of laughing and saying, you're dead to me. You've been defeated. You've been pinned by my Savior. I don't have to have you as my master. The chain has been cut. I'm untethered, right? Right? This is hard to do, honestly. I don't think that comes as a shock to any of us. There is a sin that's a struggle. There is a temptation that's real. Jesus died for sin so we can kill it. But sin feels good. That's why it's so popular, right? It, it's lies are so convincing. That's my, why so many people hold on to them. In this text, Paul addresses two types of sins that we need to kill. He says that we, we need to kill the sin of desire. He says that we need to kill the, the sin of division. And, and these are... Um, dethroning types of sins, right? They're, they unseat Christ on the throne of our lives. They say, I want to be on the throne. This sin wants to be on the throne of our lives. And, and, and they're also dehumanizing sins, right? I, a lust, what is that? I don't see you the way God sees you. I see you as an object. I'm dehumanizing you one that is created in the image of God with dignity, value, and worth, and I'm not giving you that when I'm lusting at you. There is condemning speech. I'm not like you. I'm better. You're below me. These sins are also sins that really have continued to be a stronghold in churches. And so in every letter that Paul writes to the churches, almost, he addresses these sins. 
continually. Because they tend to be the sins that want to come into churches and suffocate them from sharing the beauty, majesty, and power of Christ. Because I can tell you this, if you walk into a church full of sinners, then you would have a hard time believing that Christ is powerful, wouldn't you? That Christ can change. But he can, and he will. So let's allow that in our lives. These sins come to kill our our marriages, our churches, rip apart relationships, and they eventually seek to kill you. Too many times I hear, Pastor, how did I get here? I, I can't believe that this is where I'm at. I can't believe that this is the state of our marriage. I can't believe that, that this is what I've done. I can't believe that it's always a journey. James 1.15 says, then desire, right? The, the temptation, the lust, when it has conceived when, it, when the promise is given, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It's, it's this journey. Oh, I desire it. I'm enticed. I believe. I bite in. And I expect that it's going to keep its promise and I'm going to find satisfaction. But in the end, I don't get satisfaction. In the end, what I get is death every single time. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. One of the neat things that we do as an elder board is we pray for each other and we pray for you every time we get together. And uh, Jeremy Burris, most times when he prays, he says, Lord, help us as servants of the Lord and this ministry, servants of our home." to be killing sin so that it isn't killing us or the things we love. And just that discipleship reminder in prayer, kind of, yeah, that's right. I'm in a battle today. Yeah, that's right. I need to look at my heart today, right? Things that we realize that are easily forgotten. So what must be killed? Sins of desire. He's talking here about sexual immorality, which is the, the Greek word pornea, right, or pornai. It's, it's where we get the, the term pornography, right? And sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires. So, so he gives us this trio of lust that we're to avoid, that we're to stay away from. Listen, I, I want us to understand something. Sex is a gift from God, and it's a good one. It's to be enjoyed. It's not something that is dirty or hidden or wrong or embarrassing. But it has boundaries. And we want to honor that because that's how God says we are going to flourish. And so we're going to adhere to the boundaries so that we can worship well in the good gifts that God's given us. And that is a beautiful gift that God has given us. Any form of sexual sin outside of a Genesis 2 mandate, which is between a husband and a wife in agreement, is pornea, is, is, is wrong. Impurity is, is having evil thoughts or evil intentions, passions or physical actions that we act out on, evil desires or mental lusts that we hold close. Listen, lust is a sexual desire that, that dishonors its object and disregards God's purpose. I've heard it said that the, the problem, problem with pornography is not that we see too much, it's that we see too little of a woman because she's not just a body. She's God's daughter. If she knows the Lord as her savior, she's created in the image of God. 
He also said that there's covetousness. That, what is that? That's have moreism, right? And, and, and the Decalogue says that we have a tendency to, to, to covet people's houses and we have a, a tendency to cover, covet people's wives or, or, or cover, covet lives that we don't have. Desires, I want more and more and more. Tim Keller, uh, someone that has been in ministry for years and years said this, that he, he never had one sinner confess greed through his whole ministry. Pastor, you know what I'm struggling with? Greed. He said I, he, hundreds of other sins, but, but that one is sneaky. <laughs> that, that one we don't necessarily see coming for us, the sin of covetousness, desire, greed. That's why Jesus in Luke 12, 15 says, watch out, you may be greedy. Watch it, 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 it will come and get you, and you didn't expect it. Watch out. Watch out. You can start coveting someone, someone else's relationship. You can start coveting someone else's stuff. You can start coveting someone else's spouse. Watch out for the passions of more stuff. Idolatry. When we desire things or people so much that we ask them to give us what only Christ can give us. We, we don't see Christ as the living water or the satisfying bread of life in some way. We feel as though um, the, that, that they can give us what we really need. There, there are times that someone will come in and, 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 and they're... they're wanting an, an adulterous relationship, and they'll say, Pastor, I, I deserve to be happy. Th this is what I should be doing. This is where I should be going. What is that? There's, there's an idolatry there. Epithunia. That's the word. It's an over-desire. It's a, it's a desire that's gone out of control, that, that's taken away your spiritual, God-renewed mind, and it's cloudy. We can have a improper, over-sexual desire. And, and those desires can turn into identities, Right? This is my, my pronoun, or, or this is how I identify myself fully, completely, mostly out of my sexual identity, N not as in Christ. They, they can be inflaming over desires of, uh, of our bodies, and, and Scripture says that sexual sin is a sin against our body. It can be a, a dating disorder where we don't, we don't want to have God to put boundaries on our relationships before we're married. And we, we, we want to take something before we're ready or God says that we should instead of giving everything when it's time. When God said, this is the time to give yourself. God has a beautiful design. Trust it. Don't fall for these counterfeits. Pornea is not satisfying a desire. Unfortunately, it's, it's waking one up. When you're engaged in it, it is putting fuel on a fire. Lust is greedy and, and it isn't easily satisfied. And we're warned that, that these types of sin are sins against our body. And, and, and what that means is even our mind has a reward center. And every time we are involved in these lustful acts, every time you click on a pornography site, every time that you engage in this, dopamine drops and there's a reward. And I want to tell you that that reward is four times stronger then morphine. And so you hit it and hit it and hit it and hit it. And it doesn't slow down. It speeds up until it's mastering you. At first, you think you're in control. At first, you think you're managing it.
we have to put to death these sexual sins of desire. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 and 5 say this, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Each one of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passions and lust like the Gentiles or the unsaved who do not know God. What's the will of God that we abstain from this? He's a good God. He's not keeping you from something that is good for you. He's keeping you from something that wants to kill you, that wants to destroy you. My guess is that there's a lot of people sitting here right now that this is an uncomfortable conversation for. Dozens of people may be struggling. The, the, the stats are staggering when it comes to these type of sins. 10% of males say that they don't struggle with lust. That's just 10%. 80% of men admit to using pornography. 60% of them are Christian men who have viewed pornography at least once in that year, and they admit it. 35% of Christians say that they've viewed pornography in the last week. This is a $90 billion business. It's more than Major League Baseball, the NFL, all the Major League programs together in money making. And one of the things that we have to realize is you think it's not hurting anyone in your privacy if you're hitting and watching. Um, it's completely connected to sex trafficking and dehumanizing women all over the world. Pray for our young men, top consumers, 12 to 17-year-old. Fastest growing consumer, women, one in six women, is now engaging in pornography. There's also fantasy world, 50 shades of gray world, Right? And sometimes, ladies, because I, I think through some of this talk, you're kind of hitting your husband and saying, watch out. I, I want you to understand that oftentimes I, I'll, I'll have a conversation with a woman and, and she'll have what I would call comparison pornography. It's not image pornography, which is awful, but it's comparison pornography. You go out to eat with another couple and he's funny and carries the conversation, and you go home thinking, I wish, wish my husband was funny and could carry the conversation. And pretty soon, you start looking at what he's not instead of what you've got and what God's given you. And it's not too long before I'm not satisfied. It's the same trail, just a different thing. He's looking at objects, and has a fantasy world there, and you're looking at this and beginning a fantasy world there. Be careful. Watch out. Kill it. Believer, you've been bought with a price. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Fight. Fight it. Young man, fight it. Dad, fight it. Wife, fight it. Daughter, fight it. It wants to destroy you. Reminds me of a story of Eskimos and how they protect their cattle or whatever it is that they can raise in that cold environment, the wolves know where the food is. And the wolves come in, and the wolves start picking off their livestock. 
And so what they'll often do is when they kill an animal for food, they'll take the blood and they'll make blood popsicles. And they'll make it over a machete. And you know what happens? The wolves come in and the wolves smell the blood. And they begin to go crazy. And they lick and lick and lick. And at first it's so satisfying. It tastes so wonderful. And they lick and they lick and they lick. But soon they start to realize, wow, this is even warm. It was cold. Well, guess what? It's their own tongue. And they're shredding their own selves. And they are slowly dying, licking, 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 and fall over dead. That's pornography. That's lust. That's sexual sin. It starts off wonderful. And you get the reward, and you get the reward, and you get the reward. But in time, it destroys, kills, stops. Second sin is the sin of division. Anger deep, smoldering bitterness. I hate you. Wrath, sudden outburst of anger. It's the check engine light of the soul when we get angry, when we say unkind things, right? Malice is evil speak that that comes out of our mouths, words that tear down, Um, words like you always or you never they, the, they are condemning in nature, not correcting, not building up, not encouraging or affirming. They're, they're condemning and, and, and they're full of malice. Slander is to blaspheme someone. Gossip does that. Lying, it says, does that. We, we blaspheme our brother and sister in Christ every time we gossip about them, every time we slander them, every time we lie about them. And when we When we blaspheme them, we blaspheme Christ. It's connected. James gives us a description of the power of the tongue. It says that the tongue is a a world of unrighteousness, that it's 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 something that that comes over the whole body and stains the whole body. It can stain the whole church body. It's out of control and it's a consuming fire. Who can contain it? We can bless God and worship with our tongue. And in the next instance, right, we can curse others and blaspheme them. When we spew words of death, our mouths make us hypocrites of who we say we are as Christians. And it always hurts the name of Christ. Foolishly, we think too often that the words are separate from us because they just come out of our mouths. They don't stay in us or with us. So we just... We spit them out. Words just go out and, oh, I didn't mean it. It, it just was a moment. Had a bad day at work. I didn't mean it. But, but Jesus kind of calls us out on that. And he says, listen, our speech is from the heart, right? We live out of our hearts. And so Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He's saying, no, I'm calling foul on the, it's separate from me. It's your heart when you say something unkind. It's your heart when you gossip that's dark, that's wicked. It's your heart when you slander. It's a heart issue. It's, it's like rubbish, James says. It, it stinks. It fills the air. It's like a, you know, walking through rotting things. We assassinate someone's character or we um, commit tiny acts of murder when we speak ill of one another. This can destroy a marriage. I've seen strong, confident women become nothing but wallflowers because their husband has verbally berated them over the years of their marriage. When I knew them before they were married, they were capable, expressive, full of life, a twinkle in their eye, and now they're just there. I know of children who have 
put a pillow over their head and cried and are fearful of getting married because they hear their mom and dad in the next room night after night after night after night just shoot out in the okay corral. Worse than that, they mimic it someday. Our speech matters. Ask God to reform it. Don't think it's not a big deal. Oh, the heavy thing was the porno thing. This is not, no. We can't treat it like a pet that we put outside and are nice to everybody, but as soon as we get upset or as soon as we get angry, we bring it in and let it explode. What do, I, what do I need to do to kill it? I need to understand that I have to have a, a vision of victory. How do, I, how do I kill sin? Killing sin is an issue of belief. Pastor, why do I keep sinning? What is the why? Sins are not mistakes, gang. Sins are beliefs. And you believe the lie of the sin. Whatever it's telling you, that's why you are not killing it. Because you believe if you kill it, you will miss it. You believe if you kill it, you will be less than. You believe if you kill it, you will not have something that's going to give you something that God can't give you. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. Sins are not mistakes, they're beliefs, they're promises that are not true. We must believe that Jesus is more beautiful, more satisfying than your sin. And until you believe that, you will not kill it. You will try to manage it, you will try to hide it, but you will not kill it. So next time sin's talking to you, tell it it's a liar. Tell it it's dead. Tell it that you do not need it because you are revived in Christ, new creature in Christ. That's not who you are. So sin is an issue of belief, and killing sin is also an issue of belief. You might see others killing sin and say, how do they do that? Are they just goody two-shoes? Are they like superhuman Christians? No, by the grace of God, they look to Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. And they believe him. And they want to be like him. You know, marketing is interesting. When you do marketing research, there is um, bio-behavior theory that comes out of that. And what that means is this. The best um, uh, predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So people are pattern junkies, right? Right? We, we buy the same brand. We always have to sit in the same pew when we come to church, right? And, and so what they know is that you're going to go, if they can get you to be brand recognized, you're going to go to the same supermarket, walk down the same aisle, right? Pick up the same brands from the same shelves. And we have a tendency, even though we're new creatures, to do that with our old self, with our sin nature, Experiencing experience says this is who you are. You will always purchase this sin. No, you have been raised. Listen to me. You're not made for buying from the bottom shelf anymore. Stop being that same sin. From the same shelf, you have been raised. Now we can seek the things that are above. We can look up at the top shelf, and we're going to look at that top shelf next week. Do, Do you believe that you have been raised? This is not ethereal. This is not feel good jargon. This is a spiritual reality. You are more than conquerors through Christ. It is possible. Not only is it possible, it is inevitable. He that began a good work in you will complete it. 
since Christ gave you a unique ability to desire him. What is the best way that I can fight my sin? Desire him. He gave you a will and a desire for you to desire salvation. And he can give you a desire to love him more than you love your sin. Your experience is not impossible. It is inevitable. So break free from the tether and be who God has saved you, given you the victory to be. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promises of your word. Lord, these are two areas of sin that we can truly struggle in. Father, would you allow us to kill them not in our strength and not in our power, for that would be futile. But because they are already beaten, broken, and destroyed by Christ, and we are in Christ, victory can be ours. Father, we pray for those that are struggling with sexual sin. Lord, would you free them from that? Pray, Father, for those that are struggling with their mouth and what's pouring out of it. Father, we ask that you would change that, soften that, that their speech would be speech that brings life instead of death. And the reason is, yes, we want to see change and flourishing, but ultimately we want to glorify you who saved us. So even as we worship now and use our mouth to do that, would you be glorified? And would we be challenged to mortify the flesh? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.